Hey friends, it's Mr. Lester. Today we're reading The King's Stilts by Dr. Seuss, so I thought it fitting to wear my crown. Come on, let's get started. The King's Stilts by Dr. Seuss. Naturally, the king never wore his stilts during business hours. When King Bertram worked, he really worked, and his stilts stood forgotten in the tall stilt closet in the castle's front hallway. There was so much work to be done in the kingdom of Ben that King Bertram had to get up every morning at five. Long before the townsfolk and the farmers were awake, the king was splashing away in his bath. It was right there, in fact, that his day's work began. With his left hand, he could bathe with his royal bath brush, but his right hand he always had to keep dry for signing the important papers of state. Eric, his page boy, brought in these papers on a big silver tray. He stood at attention at the foot of the tub while old Lord Droon took the papers one by one and held them over the water for his majesty to sign. Sign here, sign there, old Droon would say, and hurry, sire, hurry, there are hundreds more to come. It was just the same at breakfast. The king cut and buttered his toast with only his left hand. With his right, he kept signing royal orders and commands. By seven every morning, the king had always finished more business than most kings do in a month. He had to get all this done before seven. For that was the hour when the big work commenced, the most difficult important work in the whole kingdom of Ben. This was the work of caring for the mighty tr dike trees that protected the people of Ben from the sea. The sea pushed against the kingdom on three sides. The kingdom was a low one. The sea was a high one. And only the dike trees kept the sea from pouring in. They grew so close together in a row along the shore that they held back the water in their heavy, knotted roots. But to keep these trees strong and sturdy was not an easy task. They were more spicy than pine trees, and their roots were very tasty to a certain sort of bird. This was a kind of giant blackbird with a sharp and pointed beak. Nizzards, they were called by the people of Bin. These nizzards were always flying about over the dike trees, waiting for a chance to swoop down and peck. If nobody stopped them, the roots would soon give way. Then the sea would pour in with a terrible roar, and every last soul in the kingdom would drown. But King Bertram did not permit this to happen. He had gathered together in his kingdom the largest and smartest cats in the world, and had trained them to chase the nizzards away. These cats were called the patrol cats and wore badges that said PC. Everything in Bin, said King Bertram, depends on our patrol cats. They are more important than our army, our navy, and our fire department too, for they keep the nizzards away from our dike trees, and the dike trees keep the ocean back out of our land. A thousand cats in all, they divided up the work. Five hundred guarded the kingdom by day, the other 500 kept watch through the night. At seven every morning came the changing of the cat guard. At the sound of the trumpet, the king left his breakfast and mounted his horse for the daily review. Fresh, brisk, and well-fed, the 500 day cats marched past him towards the dike trees to take up their watch. At the same time, the night cats, muddy, tired, and hungry, headed home to their kennels for their 12 hours rest. There was rest for the cats. There was none for the king. It took every minute of his morning to see that they were given the very best of care. The huts that they slept in must be kept clean and tidy. Each cat must be brushed and his whiskers trimmed just so. The cat kitchen was even bigger and grander than the king's, and the cooks who did the cooking were the chief cooks in the land. Your majesty, the chief in charge of fish, would always say, tell us that you think the food we feed our cats is perfect, 
and the king would look over the huge wet baskets of fish, choosing only the finest and freshest to serve to his patrol cats. So went the morning, then all afternoon, both in winter and summer, the king made his rounds by the edge of the sea. Every root of every dike tree he inspected every day. But finally, at five o'clock, the great task was finished. Then the king smiled. A hard day, he'd say. Full of nizzardly worries. A long day, he'd say. Now it's time for some fun. This was the moment King Bertram lived for. When he worked, he really worked. But when he played, he really played. Quick, Eric, he'd shout. Quick, Eric, the stilts. Down the slope from the dike trees, away from all troubles, the king and Eric would race like two boys straight to the tall stilt closet in the castle's front hallway. Out came the stilts, up leapt the king. High in the air, his royal robe streaming, he'd race through the marble halls, out across the terrace, up and down the garden stairs. Black-spotted coach dogs barked and romped beside him, nipping at the heels of his flashing red stilts. The townsfolk looked on from the walls and just loved it. A grown-up king on stilts, they'd say, does look rather strange, but it's hard work being king, and he does his work well. If he wants to have a bit of fun, sure, let him have it. But there was one man in Bin who didn't like fun, he didn't like games, he didn't like laughing. This man was a scowler. This man was Lord Droom. Laughing spoils the shape of the face, he declared. The lines at the corners of the mouth should go down. Every afternoon when the stilt hour drew near, Lord Droon would slink away to his room in the northwest corner and sulk. Such carryings on, he would mutter in disgust as he spied on the king from his window. Look at his crown bouncing up and down on the side of his head. Look at his beard flapping in the wind. Look at him laughing right out in broad daylight in front of the townsfolk. I must do something about this. And one day he did. One Wednesday, just before supper, when he thought that the king was out, Lord Droon tiptoed down to the front hall. The guards at their posts were dozing. Without the smallest sound on the hard stone floor, Droon crept to the stilt closet, pulled back the ancient door, and reached in. It only took a second. He had the king's stilts. He unbuttoned the top of his long robe and shoved them down inside. Then he sneaked past the guards again and slipped through the door. Down the steep, slanting stairway, Lord Droon marched with the stilts down to the furnace to burn them. This is the end of the king's foolish stilt walking, he mumbled to himself. Then suddenly, from around the bend of the stairs below, came the sound of happy whistling. The king! Lord Droon stopped, still, almost frozen with fright. He tugged and pulled at his long, flowing gown, struggling to cover the stilts, but he couldn't. The ends were too long and stuck out. Droon! Droon! gasped Lord Droon. You'll be caught! He turned and fled back up toward the stairway. Nearer and nearer came the king, but Droon couldn't climb any faster. The stilts clattered. They banged and spanked against his knees. He looked up and saw a window. Stepping up to it quickly, he poked his head out. He looked down into an alley. A small boy was passing. It was Eric, the page boy. Psst! You! You! Lord Drone hissed in a hoarse, nervous whisper. Eric looked up, astonished. Yes, sir? He bowed politely. Take these stilts, commanded Lord Drone. Take them away. Bury them deep, where no one can ever find them. Bury them by the sea, by the dike trees. Lord Drone flung the stilts from the window. The king's stilts? Bury them? Eric didn't know what to think. It was spoiled all his majesty's fun, he stammered. You're impudent, said Lord Drone harshly. I said bury those stilts. What's more, young man, don't you ever come back or I'll have you locked up. I'll have no impudent boy around this castle. But I'm the king's own page boy, gasped Eric, hardly able to understand this dreadful command. You were the king's own page boy, snapped Lord Droon. He pulled in his head and slammed down the window. Never before had Eric been so puzzled. Never in his life had he felt so sad. But there was nothing to do but obey the command. 
he picked up the stilts and walked straight toward the road that led to the sea. It was the hour that the townsfolk were all having supper. Nobody saw him dig the deep hole. Nobody saw him bury the stilts. At five the next afternoon, the halls of the castle echoed the king's mournful shouts. Droom! Droom! They're gone! They're gone! The king stood groping the empty stilt closet, hopelessly searching for what wasn't there. Lord Droon chuckled to himself. He had expected this to happen and was ready with his lie. It was the townsfolk who did it, he said, peering into the stilt closet and pretending to be greatly shocked. I have seen them every day plotting behind the castle walls. A king, they say, should behave like a king and sit with pomp and dignity upon his royal throne. A king, they say, should never walk on stilts. It's too bad, your majesty, but you must try to do without them. King Bertram answered with a heartbroken sigh, Well, I'll try to do without them. But he couldn't. Day after day, he grew sadder and sadder. For long hours, he'd just sit idly drumming with his fingers on his arms of his throne. He couldn't keep his mind on his work. His commands to the patrol cats sounded feeble and faint. The cats seemed to know it and wouldn't obey. Day by day, they grew lazier and lazier. Uncombed and unbrushed, they slept most of the day and grew fat. No one bothered to put their PC badges on them, for as chasers of nizzards, they weren't worth a thing. Day by day, the nizzards grew bolder and bolder. They cackled and fluttered over the dike trees. They flew down and almost seemed to sneer at the lazy sleeping cats. The townsfolk began to feel frightened. Housewives couldn't keep their minds on their housework. They heard nizzards flapping over their rooftops and poked their heads out for a look. If the cats don't keep those nizzards away from our dike trees, they asked of one another, what will keep the ocean back out of our land? Bootmakers couldn't keep their minds on their boots. Goldsmiths couldn't keep their minds on their gold. Cart drivers couldn't keep their minds on where they were going. They'd stop their carts on the road and talk in low, excited whispers. Look at those nizzards. Where are the cats? I'll tell you where the cats are. Everywhere they shouldn't be and mostly fast asleep. Something must be done with the king. Yes, something certainly is wrong with the king. Only Eric the page boy knew what was wrong. Night after night he tossed in his bed thinking of the stilts lying deep underground. Finally, one night he couldn't stand it any longer. Droon or no droon, he would go to the king. At dawn the next day, he leapt out of bed and made it straight for the castle. Breathless and panting, he raced through the royal gates and up the broad stairs. The king was strolling sadly out on the terrace with Lord Droon and two guards. Eric rushed up. He must tell the king. Droon or no Droon, he was going to tell. But Lord Droon saw him coming and stepped quickly forward. Impudent boy, what are you doing here? Before Eric could answer and push past him to the king, Lord Droon had grabbed him. He looked at Eric sharply and suddenly, with the corners of his mouth, turned up with a grin. A shrewd, evil grin. Your face, he said. What's wrong with your face? My face, said Eric. He rubbed his hand over his forehead. It was merely hot and moist from running. Nothing at all is wrong with my face. It's red, said Lord Droon with his sly look he always had when he lied. It's awfully, awfully red. Measles, he shouted. Ho, oh, guards, take him away. Lock him up. I haven't measles any more than you have, shouted Eric. It's a trick, a nasty droonish trick. Let me talk to the king. But they dragged poor Eric, fighting and kicking, away from the king, down the castle stairs. Five minutes later, Eric found himself locked up in an old deserted house on the edge of town. For the sec from the second story window, he could see two guards. Spears crossed just below him, barring the door. Through the roof, he could hear the noises of the nizzards. Their beaks were as hard as iron and scratched through the air. Eric shuddered. There must be a way to escape. Round and round the room he paced, thinking and thinking. He went to the window and looked down again. Then he whistled softly. He had an idea. Very quickly, Eric slipped off his belt. He pushed the end through the buckle and made a lasso. Then he leaned from the window and aimed for the speared points. He dropped the loop. It caught. He jerked the belt tight and tied a quick knot. 
Look, guards, look, shouted Eric as he jumped up on the window sill. Your spears are tied together. If the guards had dropped their spears, they could have caught him in a second. But they didn't. They just yelled at each other and yanked and tugged, stupidly trying to pull the spears apart. By the time they finally had them untied, Eric had sprung to the tree outside his window, slid down the trunk, and quietly escaped. Eric ran through backyards and alleyways to escape the angry guards. The streets were deserted, no people at all. They were all at home, trembling with their window shades pulled down. The air was full of chittering and chattering of nizzards. They were cutting through the clouds like flying black knives, flying nearer, flying lower, down to earth to eat the dike tree roots, soon to let the sea pour in. Eric ran. He turned a corner. He stopped and stared with horror. Flowing gently toward him down the sloping alley came a little trickling stream. Water, he whispered hoarsely. He dipped his finger. It tasted of salt. Sea water! One dike tree must already have been eaten clean through. Not a second to lose, gasped Eric. I must dig up the stilts. Up the hill to the dike trees where the king's stilts lay buried, right into the very thick of the nizzards. They flapped and screeched about him. They hissed as he dug. Gritch, gritch, snarled the nizzards. Gritch to you, snapped back Eric, furiously pelting them with fists full of mud. The harder they fought him, the faster he dug. His fingers touched the stilts at last. He pulled them from the ground, stilts bouncing on his shoulder again. Eric ran. The road to the castle took him back through the town. The streets were still deserted. Close by the door of an old tailor's shop, Eric stopped for an instant to rest. The stilts had begun to hurt his shoulder. Those two guards, he thought, I wonder where they are. He found out all too soon, from around the corner at his very elbow, suddenly bellowed the angry voice of Lord Droon. You guards, guards indeed, to let a little pipsqueak of a boy tie your, your spears, dunderheads, search every street, search every house. Eric heard the clatter of the heavy hobnail boots. No time to run, nowhere to hide. Wait, those clothes in the tailor shop. Eric ducked inside. An instant later, Lord Droon and the guards appeared around the corner. Search the tailor shop first, commanded Lord Droon. But just as he said this, from out of the shop strode a strange tall man. There was something very odd about the hang of this robe. His hat was pulled down far over his eyes. Those eyes, muttered Drune. Have I seen them before? He stepped in front of the tall man, blocking his path. The tall man's mouth went suddenly dry. Are you? Are you? He stammered hoarsely. Are you by any chance seeking a small boy with no belt? Which way, shouted the guards. Which way did he go? That way, said Eric. He nodded toward the sea. With a clatter of hobnails, the two guards were off, Lord Droon sputtering and scolding along behind them. No time to shrink down to a boy again, thought Eric. I'll have to stay a tall man. On to the castle, Eric raced in his disguise over fences and thickets, through or orchards and fields of corn. Everywhere he saw patrol cats, useless and limp, fast asleep on haystacks, dozing in trees. Then suddenly, just ahead, he saw the king. He was sitting on a little pile of stones just outside the castle gate. His robe was not pressed, his crown wasn't shined, and he had deep, sad circles under both of his eyes. Your majesty, your majesty, shouted Eric as he clattered up behind him. The king paid no attention. Eric leaned down and shouted right into his ear. Very slowly, the king turned his head. Well, sighed King Bertram, and who may you be? I'm Eric, cried Eric. He let the robe that was covering him drop to the ground. The king's own red stilts flashed bright in the sun. Down from the stilts leapt Eric the page boy. Up onto the stilts sprang Bertram the king. He drew a great kingly breath, the first one in weeks. His head shot up high, his chest broadened wide. Bertram of Bin was sturdy, straight, and strong again, and every inch a king. Patrol cats! It was the loudest command ever shouted in Bin. 
The king's voice seemed to roll up from the deep in his boots. It echoed down the valleys. It rumbled through the hills. From wherever they had wandered, the cats heard the call. They fell in line. They fell in step. They marched ahead, a thousand strong. Up the hill to the dike trees, they followed Eric and the king. Day cats to the left flank. Night cats to the right. Charge! The king shouted. A hundred thousand nizzards stopped their pecking and sprang to meet the charge. The dike trees shook as the cats roared their war cry. The sea's surface swirled into a raging whirlpool. The noise was heard in Samba land, five hundred miles away. The fur flew fast, but the feathers flew faster. It only took ten minutes. The kingdom was saved. The townsfolk stopped trembling indoors behind their windows. They rushed out from their houses and filled the air with cheers. Then the king punished Droon in the most fitting way. He sent him to live by himself with a guard of patrol cats in the old deserted house with a sign that said measles and made him eat nizzards three times a day, stewed nizzards for breakfast, cold nizzards for lunch, fried nizzards for supper, and every other Thursday they served him nizzard hash. But to Eric, his page boy, the king gave a fine and just reward. He ordered the royal carpenter to make another pair of stilts, tall stilts, red and flashing, exactly like his own. From then on, every day at five, they always raced on stilts together. And when they played, they really played. And when they worked, they really worked. And the cats kept the nizzards away from the dike trees, and the dike trees kept the water back out of the land. The End